It was the most feared fighting machine in Europe for 300 years. It allowed a small emirate on the fringes of both the Seljuk and Byzantine empires to grow to unimaginable size, to rival even that of the Romans of old. This was not because of fanatical and disciplined Ghazis, or its expert and feared horsemen, or even its exaggerated numerical superiority. The truth being contrary to popular belief, Ottomans did not zerg rush the enemy, but because of its institutions, bureaucracy, and governing ability to adapt and bring together its vast dominion under a central state. The classical period of the Ottoman army, from 1451 to 1606, is where the Ottomans were at the height of its military success. It was during this period that they inherited the title of empire by dealing the killing blow to the Byzantines, expanding much into the Balkans and conquering the vast share of eastern Anatolia and the Middle East. Its many military engagements across Europe, Africa and Middle East shows it as a powerhouse of the region. The Ottoman army of preceding years before the rise of Mehmet II were marked by the introduction of the Janissary Corps, an elite slave-based military unit, and two other events that stood out in the years between 1300 and 1451. First of these was the creation and replacement for the Yaya system, the first iteration of a standing army which proved a failure in its attempt to provide an effective infantry unit, in contrast to the traditional armies that relied heavily on Turkoman cavalry. Secondly, the settling of nomadic Turkoman cavalry to a fief-based Timar system adopted from their brethren and previous overlords, the Seljuks. The classical period exemplified the ability of the Ottomans to implement changes that proved its most important asset, adopting various tactics from many peoples and bringing it together to another advantage. By the end of the 16th century, the structure of the Ottoman army resembled this. The army could be separated into two branches, the provincial forces and the household of the sultan. When a sultan was or vizier went to war, he would take a large portion of his Kapukula regiments with him, and included a much larger force of provincial soldiers. Unique for its time, the Ottoman army included a professional standing army, the Kapukula Corps, originally built around the first Janissary Corps to counterbalance the Timariat cavalry. The Kapukula became the most organized loyal and feared military force both at home and abroad. In this episode, we will discuss just one branch of the Ottoman army's provincial forces, the Timariat Sipahi. Despite the effectiveness of the Kapukula, the backbone of the Ottoman army was its provincial Timariat cavalry, the Sipahi, who made up the largest and most effective force of any battle. Similar to European feudal lords, the Timar holders had to provide one fully armed and armoured horse rider during times of war. These men trained continuously, just as European knights, with a focus on horse archery, large unit tactics, and javelin throwing. One major difference between a Timariat Sipahi and a feudal lord was that Sipahi had no right to land other than the right to collect his taxes, govern, provide security, and vital statistics for the palace. He had to work it along with the villagers in the fields were essentially free men compared to serfs in Europe, for example in France. If the revenues produced from the Timar were from 20,000 to 100,000 akjes, the currency of the Ottoman Empire at the time, the Timar would be called a ziemet. If they were above 100,000 akjes, the land would be called a hus. The more tax value of your Timar, the more riders you have to provide, one for each 3,000 akjes. These men were called jebelus, and was similar to European men-at-arms or squires. A timar would be granted to anyone who proved themselves multiple times in battle, or impressed the central government in some way. Some of the larger timars went to some of the sultan's favorites. This was a sure way for upward social mobility in the Ottoman Empire. However, if a sipahi was unable, however, if a sipahi was unable to provide military support, he would be evicted from his land. The Ottoman army swelled with many previous Timar holders, who would throw their lives on the line to regain wealth and stature. At times of war, each Timar holder was answerable to a local Sanjak Bey, who was in charge of multiple Timar Sipahis. They were gathered under a single horsetail standard. In turn, the Sanjak Bey answered to the governor or the Bela Bey in which he presided in and gathered around his horsetail banner. The Sultan would have four horsetail banners, which resided in Istanbul. To give an example, 
or one of the core ARLETs before 1700s, the Rumeli ARLET was divided into 17 Sanjaks, one being the Sanjak of Sofia, which was also the capital of the Rumeli ARLET administration division. Sofia just by itself had 50 Timars. One of every 10 Timars would stay behind to protect the peace in times of war. The Timar system was an effective strategy that prevented entrenchment and ensured loyalty to the state and the Sultan above all else, while also acting as an effective military hierarchy during battle. The Sipahi during battle was organized into two sides, the Anatolian and the Rumeli Sipahi. They then would organize themselves into where the campaign was taking place. If the campaign was taking place in Europe, the Rumeli Sipahi would take on the right side of the Sultan, while the Anatolian would be on the left, and vice versa if it was taking place in the Middle East. Not all Sipahi were of Turkish origin, and many had retained their religion for many years while serving the Ottoman Empire. The last recorded Christian Sipahi was in the late 15th century. The Sultanate found it easy to convert the previous Byzantium Pronoia feudal system into a Timar system, allowing many lords to retain their position who later converted. The arms and armor of a Sipahi or Jebelu retainers differed depending on their location. The Anatolian Sipahi was lightly armored, reflecting its Turkoman horse archer roots. Scale, leather, chainmail, or even unarmored, they would go into battle, while a Rumeli Sipahi would have had heavy armor similar to Byzantium cataphracts and reflecting their European origin. A 14th century Turkish epic lists a warrior's weapons as a warhammer, four types of mace and flail, two types of quiver, infantry crossbow, javelin, cavalry javelin, short sword, pike, saber, light spear, lance, sword blade, arrows, Turkish bow, bow case, war axe, and lasso. Although the Janissaries stole the show and inspired part of the European infantry revolution, with their disciplined guns and exotic origins, it was the Sipahis of the household and the provinces that proved the most crucial to the Ottoman strategies. Almost always used to flank the enemy one minute at a time, attack weaker spots and surround whenever possible with charging lances or deadly arrow harassment. During defensive operations, the Sipahis would either remain behind the infantry, supporting them with a shower of arrows, or similarly to European heavy cavalry tactics, they joined infantry defensive formations in dismantled roles, sometimes acting as officers or role models for the infantry. They always looked for the opportunity to make use of any weakness within the attacking enemy formation. Commonly used tactics and techniques with diversionary attacks, sudden change of wings, raids behind enemy lines, and various kinds of lures. Thus, Sipahis preferred offensive roles rather than being on the defensive, as in 1516. Interestingly, Sipahis also took part in naval operations alongside Janissaries. Compared to the European knight, who was used in a crashing charge to rout the enemy and decide the battle, the Sipahi was used in a more complex large unit tactics. The success or failure of a Sipahi decided the outcome of the battle and remained the top tier cavalry unit in Europe late into the 17th century. <laughs>